know, the last two weeks when we've, um, we, we've been very thankful to God for all our children and young people, and then when they're just about to, to go out, I've turned around, and the first five rows have been completely empty. I've been like in a sea of nothingness right in the middle of it there. And um, then some uh, parents have come back in and joined me, and I haven't felt too lonely. But it's great to have um, a real cross-section of ages in our church, and we give thanks to God for each one. Let's pray. Father God, we, uh, we thank you so much that it is by faith that we take hold of the promises that you've given to us. We thank you that uh, those promises are, have all come true in Jesus Christ. And so help Jesus to be our focus this morning. As we look at another character from the Old Testament, we're thankful too that everything points to Christ. And so we pray for your blessing and your help and your sight for us to see the things and to act upon them that you're pointing out to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, is that working? Have you switched my channel over? Thank you very much. Here we go. This is the litmus test every week. And if it doesn't work, we don't bother. That's fine. Don't worry about it. See if Alex can get it up. Right, keep your Bibles open. The great thing about Jonah is, I don't know if your Bible's the same as mine, but I can open the book up and the whole thing's there on one, literally one page or two pages. So keep it open and uh, we'll see where we go with it. Have you heard the one about the guy who um, tried to run away from God, got swallowed by a fish, um, put it right again, and a whole nation turned back to God? It's a great story. But if you grew up with, um, please don't be distracted by the screen, don't worry about it. Just let's, 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 let's listen. Okay. Um, the, the thing is, if you grew up with a children's Bible, um, no doubt this story was in there. But also, probably, most probably, you, you, you had a, a separate copy of it as well. There was a picture up there that was going to come up, but it's not going to come up now. Um, we, we've got one at home. Uh, the story of Jonah is a really, really popular story. Um, for anyone, but, but particularly for children. The thing is, if you have grown up with the story, the danger is that we stop three quarters of the way through the story, don't we? We stop there and we think, what a great story. It all turned out really well in the end, and everyone's very happy. But if we miss chapter four, if we miss the last part of the story of Jonah, then actually we've missed the key to the whole book. And we've missed something really important about the character of Jonah as well. Now, in this series, um, uh, Walking by Faith, we looked at various Old Testament characters. Now, if you're sharp and you've picked up the notes or you've been thinking about today already, um, actually, today is a departure to what we try to pick out from, from all the other weeks. Because in every um, character so far, we've picked up one particular trait of faith that we can aspire to, that we can look at their lives and say, wow, what can God teach me about their faith? Now, Jonah is actually the complete opposite to that because it's precisely what he didn't show in his life that we're going to learn about today. Humility. We're going to learn about humility. Humility, Pam had a little quote there, but I think humility is about not thinking more highly of yourself than you should do. Not thinking you're better than you are. I, I learned humility at a very, uh, well, a few years ago when I started playing squash, right? Um, never picked up a racket, really, until about three or four years ago. Turned up for my first few games, and you sort of, it's 1v1, isn't it? So you eye up your opponent. What they like, I'm sure I can be quicker than them, sharper than them. But I learned the lesson that you should never do that. Because um, I met a 13-year-old who roundly whacked me and beat me. And I met a 70-year-old who did precisely the same. No matter that I was quicker, it's just they had me running a lot more. <laughs> Don't think about yourself more highly than you should. And three important lessons that we're going to learn about Jonah's story today about humility. Christian humility is about understanding your place before God, your relationship with God, the way you treat him, the way you respond to him, the way you look up to him. Humility. How are we going to learn that? Let's, let's learn these three things together. Your sheets will help. If, if there's nothing on the screen, that's fine. First thing is this. We need the humility of a changed life, not simply the right words. 
See, Jonah was a prophet. Um, it doesn't specifically say that in our story of Jonah here, if you, if you see at the beginning of the book, but we see that he was a prophet given um, some of the other references to him in the Bible. And he was appointed by God, in this case, to bring a message to a whole nation. He was to speak against, sorry, a whole city. He was to speak against the city of Nineveh because of their wickedness against God. Verse 2 of chapter 1. Very unusually for a prophet, he ran away. He scarpered. He disobeyed. He decided that wasn't for him. And if you look through um, the prophets in the Old Testament, you see many, many examples of faithfulness and obedience. Hosea obeyed the call uh, from God to go and marry an unfaithful wife. We saw earlier in our uh, series uh, on, on Old, Old Testament characters that Abraham, Abraham was someone who obeyed God through some things that were very uncertain in his life. He walked away from home. He left his home and everything he had to follow God's call. He was prepared to sacrifice his own son because he was obedient to God and trusted that God had a way. And God provided a ram as a substitute for his son Isaac. Obedience. But here, Jonah is given a, 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 city, a, a message to the city of Nineveh and he runs in the opposite direction. Why does he do that? Now, much of the time we get scared, don't we, if, if we are worried about the responses of other people to, to, to us talking about God, we think, it's too much for me. Uh, I, I don't know how I'm going to handle rejection or, or responses from people. And so we struggle to do it. Is that what's going on here? Is it because of people's reactions that Jonah's scared? We'll find out later. But to summarize the thread of the story, here we go. Jonah, in running away, boards a ship too far, far away, but you can't run from God. God sends a storm. Jonah's thrown into the sea. God sends a huge fish to swallow him up. For three days, he's inside the fish, and he prays to God, and God commands the fish to spit him out. Jonah's given a second chance. He goes and preaches to the city of Nineveh. People are cut to the heart. They repent. They turn back to God, and God stop short from judging them. He has compassion, he relents. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Great, you might say. But let's have a think about some examples of humility that we see from the reactions of various people in this story, and let's tr try and judge what we can see from it. What about the sailors? We haven't read chapter 1, but the sailors in chapter 1 from that ship that Jonah's on. Well, they have to wake Jonah up to tell him to pray. Jonah's asleep on the boat. Could his God save them? When it becomes apparent that the storm was going nowhere until they throw Jonah into the sea, they called on the God of Jonah not to hold them responsible for his death if they were going to throw him in. When the sea went calm as a result of Jonah going into it, we read in verse 16 of chapter 1 that the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and vows to him. That response from those sailors was a very appropriate um, response to God in the Old Testament. Many examples of people sacrificing and making vows to God. So the sailors, in their humility and their fear of God, seem to respond rightly. What about the Ninevites in chapter 3? We heard that earlier. Jonah is given a second chance from God. He goes to Nineveh, proclaims judgment on the city... And in verse 5, very clear and straight, the Bible tells us the Ninevites believed God. They fasted and prayed. The king said, let everyone urgently, call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. In both responses from the pagan sailors, and the pagan city, there seemed to be a real fear of God and a humility before him. When God saw what, what they did, verse 10 of chapter 3, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Who knows, God might do this. And he did. So what about Jonah? Sandwiched between those two responses, we get Jonah in chapter 2 in the belly of the fish.
for three days. And the whole of chapter 2 is, is given over to Jonah's prayer from the fish. And I'd like to read it. And I'd like us to think about what he was doing. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swelled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me uh, barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. We see after that that the Lord commanded the fish to spit or vomit, my Bible says, Jonah out. Well, I don't know about you, but when you read that prayer, it seems a great prayer, doesn't it? You look at the elements there. He recognizes God as the controller of the seas and of his life. He paints the picture of a compassionate God who hears the prayers of people in desperation. Jonah verbalizes the need to turn back to God when we run away. He identifies God as the one from whom salvation comes. And he claims his determination to return to the Lord, to praise him and to lift up his name. Jonah uses some very spiritual language. Did you see he refers to the temple? He also talks about the futility of idols. And on the surface of the prayer, we would say, Amen, wouldn't we? We'd say, what a great prayer. Jonah's turned back to God. He's humbled himself. But the question is, how do we know if he meant it? Well, I suppose the answer is partly because of what he does next. See if it matches up. But actually, it's also about the whole thrust and the shape of his life going forward. Not just what he did, but how he did what he did. What was Jonah's life like as a result of this experience and how he was going to live after that? John the Baptist, as he was preparing the way for Jesus, he told people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. That repentance is not just the words that we say, But there's a fruitfulness that comes out of our lives because our lives are changed as we humble ourselves before God. And here's the thing, right? We've got to be careful about the words that we say and whether we're simply using the right language or whether our lives are actually changed as a result of it. And we can come to church, can't we? We can get into Christian speak and talk very politely to each other we can pray the right prayers because we're used to it or that's the thing we do we can even say what we're going to do to live for God and we can perhaps even think or mean it when we say it but what actually happens as a result of that it's not necessarily a heart change in our lives and we can sometimes I guess content ourselves that words are enough that if I've said it then it will happen, but we don't follow through. We can be sorry. When we think about repentance, there's certainly um, people were sorry in this story, weren't they, for the things that they'd done, but there is a big, big difference between regret and repentance. We can have regret, can't we? We can can be sorry for the things that we've done that we realise aren't right, or we've offended God if we relate to him, and, and yet actually repentance is more than that. Repenting is turning back. It's an action that follows through in our lives. And you know, sometimes we don't even understand ourselves. Even with the words that we say. We're so complex, aren't we? And we've got so many layers to ourselves that we say something, we're not sure whether we're going to follow through, and even if we think we are, we struggle to know where to go with it. And um, a couple of weeks ago, when we were talking about the heart, when we were looking at the character of David, we were thinking about the real benefit 
of walking life through with others, that actually being accountable to another person in our lives for being able to live and follow through with stuff can be so, so helpful. Because otherwise, sometimes we can convince ourselves that, that saying something and then things just happening might just flow through so easily. But without someone else being there beside us, helping us, keeping us accountable, praying for us specifically, and we give people the permission to pick us up on stuff. Actually, even with good intentions in our lives, we can fall short of actually following through. So I just want to, I just want to ask you as, as we're thinking about that, where, you are, where you're up to. Have you followed through on, on, or maybe you already are in relationship well enough with some people, one person, even one person here, that you can open up to and they can ask you those sorts of questions. But if you're not, I really want you to think about that. Otherwise, it's too easy to say the right things, but our lives aren't changed. A humility before God often results in a humility with others as well. The two often go hand in hand. So let's think about that. We need the humility, not just for the right language, but for a changed life. And here's the second thing from the book of Jonah. We need the humility to accept that only God's power and grace saves lives. What seems to be a very um, genuine repentance of the Ninevites, including their king, means that God relents from his judgment on them. They, they, they followed through, didn't they? Because they were giving up their evil ways, right? And in this sense, Jonah, amazingly, was the most successful Old Testament prophet there ever was. A whole city turned back to God because of the word that Jonah brought to them. Many of the great prophets like Hosea, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, met with hardened hearts when their message was brought from God to them. But the wonderful response of the, the Ninevites, it had nothing to do with Jonah, with his charisma, had nothing to do with his willpower, or his character, or his preaching skills. It was all to do with God. It was God's power. It was God's grace that saved that city. Jonah the prophet, he was disobedient. He was unprayerful. He was grumpy. We'll see in a minute. Read chapter 4, he was resentful. It actually wasn't anything to to do with Jonah. But it was all to do with God. And yet God used him. (laughs) Isn't it incredible? God used him to help a whole city repent and turn back to God himself. You see, God was at work throughout this story, like putting in place everything to make happen what he wanted to bring about. You know, um, God sent the storm. He took away the storm. He sent the fish. He, he spat Jonah out in the right place. He prepared the hearts of the Ninevites. He used Jonah's words to bring them to repentance. God did everything to make happen what he wanted to happen. And I think this just has to remind us again that it's only God's power. And it's only God's grace that saves lives. So that that brings us an encouragement and a warning. (laughs) The encouragement is this. If you're sitting here today and, and wondering, could God ever use me? I'm not clever enough. I don't feel worthy enough. I don't know enough or can't get my words out properly. Could God ever use me to bring his truth to somebody else? bring the message of the gospel? Of course he can. Of course he can. God can use you. But as soon as we start thinking that I've got something about me, God needs me, I'm the one, then there's the warning. God don't need you at all. (laughs) He can use us, he can not use us, but God does whatever he wants. And his glory is shown through his power and his grace. And we can see as we look at God's salvation in this story that everything points towards Jesus Christ. The power, the power to save is in the cross. The cross of Jesus is the power that saves our lives from death to life, from sin to forgiveness, from slavery to freedom. It is the cross As the modern hymn says, this, the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, 
We stand forgiven at the cross. The answer to your life and the answer to everybody else's life is found in God's power through the cross. And if you haven't turned your life to Jesus yet, if you haven't turned around and found that grace that Jesus offered you, please do it today. Because that's the answer for your life. And remember this. The power that is possible in anyone's life to flow through you to reach anybody else is found through the cross. Now, if Jonah was this fella that actually, you know, had all the bad traits that we're trying to pick out and say, look, Jonah, you needed to be more humble, you needed to be more obedient, um, and, and God still used him, does it mean then that it doesn't really matter how we live? Does it mean that we shouldn't pray for our children to come to faith in Christ? Does it matter that we shouldn't live holy lives at home with our unbelieving partners or, or spouses? Does it mean that we shouldn't try and learn the gospel message and help other people to understand the cross and the centrality of it for our lives? Does it mean that? No, it doesn't. There's plenty of places in the Bible that talk about the need for those things and how God wants to equip us and help us in it. But if nothing else, we just have to throw ourselves down on God's grace. You know how many times compassion comes up through that story? I know we're using different Bible translations, but the word compassion comes up so much. And God is a compassionate God. And we have to remember that his grace is the difference. So Jonah wasn't the difference, we're not the difference, but God is the difference. And when we're humble enough to accept that, we can see that he can do anything. And he is wonderful. But here's the third thing. This is where we get on to chapter 4. We need the humility to accept that God is God and his ways are right and good. There was a very successful football player and manager called Brian Clough. And um, he, uh, he won numerous, numerous trophies. Um, uh, and his nickname was Old Big Ed. And for good reason, because he thought a lot of himself. There was one time when he, he was asked in an interview what he did with players that disagreed with him. And he said, well, we, we would... I won't try and do his accent. Well, maybe I will try. It comes out. Oh, maybe we'd, uh, we'd discuss it for about 20 minutes and then we'd decide that I was right. How true, eh? We're a bit like that sometimes, aren't we? We sort of know what we know and we know why we know it and we're sure that that's what's right. It can be quite stubborn. And the final chapter of the story of Jonah reveals his heart much more fully than we've seen so far. God is building up to something here that cannot be missed. Don't stop at the end of chapter 3, okay? Um, you, can ask, you can ask around and discuss how you teach this to your children as well, but it's important, isn't it? Go and talk to Joshua. He's the youth pastor now, okay? Um, no, kidding. He is, but we can talk together. Here, look at this. Verse 1. God has shown his compassion on the city of Nineveh, right? But look, verse 1 of chapter 4, to Jonah this seemed very wrong and he became angry. I wonder if you've been angry with God. I wonder if you've ever told God that he was wrong. Or whether because you were too Christian you never said it, but you just thought it. Yeah, you can't run away from him, can you? Even your thoughts. Been angry with him? Something happened in your life that's caused you to be really raging against God, someone, something in someone else's life, or something in the world, the wider world. Why was Jonah angry at God? We're not told at the beginning of chapter 1, if you, if you look at the story, it doesn't say at the beginning of chapter 1 why Jonah ran away, but here it's revealed. Look at this. Jonah says, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I was trying to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. It's better for me to die than to live. Huh. At the beginning of the story, Jonah was told to speak against Nineveh. And so we think, surely God's going to bring judgment on it. But why does he do it? Why does God want to send Jonah there? It's not simply because he wanted to rid the city of every, every sinner. 
It's because God is a compassionate God. Why does he want to present us with our sin? Why does he want us to see it properly? It's because he wants us to be able to see it and then see that he has the answer. That forgiveness is possible through him. That grace is is possible for him because he's a compassionate God. That's why he sent Jonah there. He wanted to bring forgiveness to that city. And now Jonah says, I knew it. Knew that's what you wanted to do. And I hate you for it. Wow. Jonah was angry. God's ways didn't fit his ways. So why was Jonah particularly angry about this? Well, Nineveh, city in Assyria. Assyria were like bitter enemies of Israel. So that's reason enough, surely. But also at this particular point in time, you can go back um, and have a look at maybe some of the context in, in 2 Kings 14. But Jonah lived at a time when Assyria's power, this superpower of Assyria, the power was declining. And when God gave this word to Jonah to bring to the city, the king at the time, the Israel's king Jeroboam, he extended and secured the boundaries of Israel to try and bring extra protection. And surely Jonah must think, uh, God wouldn't do anything right now to, to threaten the security of his people. Surely now would be a great time to go in for the kill. Let's get rid of that nation and that city once and for all. Surely that's what God would do. And yet in Jonah's eyes, God seemed to do the exact opposite. That God wanted to show compassion and mercy and actually relent so that city could be saved. So this story is actually a story about how we respond to God when his ways don't always fit our ways. Sometimes God calls us to follow him in ways that are uncomfortable for us. In ways that actually we struggle with. In ways that are difficult to follow. Difficult. And Jonah is claiming that he would rather die than live and accept that God is God. (laughs) Incredible, isn't it, for a prophet? How are we going to grapple with God? How are we going to do that? When he puts a calling on us, or he puts us in situations where actually, that's not the way I would have written things. God, that's not my way of going about things. You're wrong. God, you're wrong. How are we going to grapple with him? Jonah's anger suddenly came out. The resentment must have been building, and then it boils over. Anger does that to us, doesn't it, sometimes? You know, when it's boiling under the surface, try and keep a lid on it. Pride is the opposite of humility, isn't it? And if Jonah was angry here, he must have been a proud man. Maybe for us, when we're angry, maybe that's a sign that we're proud and we think we're right. So I wonder if you have a resentment against God for anything. I wonder if you're angry with him for something that's happened to you or the way he's shaped your life. God's promise to all Christians, all Christians, is that he's working out, he's working out his covenant promises for your good. He is, he is, you have to hold on to that. God is good, he's working out his plan for your life for your good. And yet, there's some difficult things in life that we have to encounter, it's a bumpy ride, isn't it? Life can be hard. That does not mean to say God's not in it. Thought about that from the story of Esther last week. God is there. The Lord replies to Jonah. He says in verse 4, Is it right for you to be angry? As Jonah sat outside Nineveh in a bit of a sulk, he's looking at the city and he's wondering what God will actually do. Will he follow through? What's God going to do? I'm I'm going to have a watch. And at that moment, God teaches Jonah another lesson. He demonstrates again his grace and his provision. He produced a plant for Jonah because the sun was so hot on him. The the, the plant shaded him and Jonah was very happy. But then just as quickly as he produced the plant, God sent this worm. It's a weird story, isn't it? He produces this worm that eats the plant away. And then Jonah's out in the elements again. And he's so upset, he claims again that he wants to die. And God turns to him right at the end of this story. 
And he says something really important to him. You see, Jonah was so wrapped up in, in himself, so concerned about his personal situation, that he just couldn't see that God might have a desire to save that city. The Lord said, verse 10, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for that great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? In the New Testament, Jesus told a story about two sons. One son rebelled and ran away and left that family home. And when he came to his senses and he returned, the father was waiting for him with open arms. He hugged him and he wanted to throw a party and there was a celebration. But there was the older son that had been in the home all the time and the older son was angry. And he turned to the father and effectively he said to the father, you're wrong. You are wrong. How dare you throw a party for this son that has rebelled against you? He does not deserve your grace and your compassion. He's messed up. But the father, as he explains to the son, he says, why can't I? Why should I not show compassion on this son that was dead, but now is alive? Jesus, when he told that parable, he left his hearers hanging at the end of that story. Because he never, you never hear what that older son's response is to the father who says, I'm a compassionate father. And at the end of the story of Jonah, we also don't get Jonah's response to God's question. God's very, very similar question about why can't God show compassion on who he wants to show compassion on? And that's it, the end of the story. <laughs> and I think what he's doing is he's just opening it up to us to try and answer that story for ourselves. What do you think and what do we think about a God who sometimes works out his good plans in a way that is uncomfortable for us? Sometimes goes about things in a way that doesn't always fit our way. How do we treat a God like that? How do we respond to a God like that? Look, we can cry out to God. Let, don't get me wrong. We can cry out to God and we can grapple with God in so many ways. You can shout to him. If you're struggling, don't be, don't be afraid. Don't keep it in. Don't, don't pretend everything's all right. You can bring everything to him. He's big enough. He is big enough. But will we have the humility at some point to say, God, you are God. I know that you love me. You gave me Christ on the cross. That is proof enough. You would not spare anything from me. That's your promise to me. I know that. So I'm going to submit to you, Lord. In my life, even with the things I don't understand, even with my pain, even with my questions, I'm going to let you be God. I'm going to follow you. Whatever it takes, whatever it costs. Do you know when we're humble before him, I think our faith will just flourish. It will grow. Our lives will be so different. C.S. Lewis said, he said once, remember, he, God, is the artist. And you're only the picture. <laughs> so quietly submit to be painted. Ask him for forgiveness for each failure, then leaving it alone. Let's pray for humility before God. And allow him to produce fruit in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, this story is actually a real challenge to us because it ends with a question. And it ends with a question for all of us to answer. When you say, why, why can't I show my character in this way? Why can't I work out my plans in ways that perhaps are a challenge to, to, to you and to us? Lord, help us to answer that question for ourselves. Help us in our relationship with you to come to you with a humility to recognize who you are and to recognize who we are. That 
Our words are not just words, but our words result in action. That our words and our lives are born out of faith and not by human effort. And help us to realize that all the power is on your side. But you're such a great God. You're such a compassionate God and you're such a merciful God. You're the God who saves and you're the God who shapes and grows lives. Please work in our lives, wherever we are on that journey of faith. Help us to come to Christ. Help us to grow in Christ. Help us to live for Christ. Trusting you every step of the way. Help us if we need to work that through with someone else this week or ongoing, that we might have the humility to do that. Thank you. Amen.